Well, welcome everyone to the Herbert C. Kelman seminar. Um, and this is the first seminar of the of the semester. And we're very happy that all of you, there's so many of you who have joined us from all over the world. So thank you. Thank you for taking uh, time out of your busy schedules to come and um, and hear uh, all about Russia's war and Ukraine today. We are, you know, we are just commenting on how fortuitous it was that we scheduled this uh, talk today with Biden's visit just yesterday. And there's so much activity around Ukraine. And we're just delighted that we have Paul here, uh, Robitaille here to shed some really deep insight into um, into what is happening there. And she's got some wonderful photographs. So I have a feeling we're in for a real treat. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, I just want to say that this seminar, as you probably know, is co-sponsored by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law. And if you would like, the program is being, uh, the seminar is being, um, is being recorded. So if you would like to um, you know, share it with your friends or let other people know. In a couple of days, check on the program on negotiation website under events, and you will be able to see it um, see it there. But uh, I would love to just tell you a little bit about Paul Robitaille. She um, is an independent journalist and lawyer, and, and she was here as a fellow at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism in 2001 and 2002. She has lived in Moscow from 1990 to 1996, and she left journalism to work as an adjudicator for the Refugee Board of Canada in 2004. She was later elected to the National Assembly of Quebec, where she served from 2018 to 2022. After leaving politics, she returned to journalism and revisited a quarter century later, countries dear to her heart, once republics of the former Soviet Union. So um, I am, again, as I said, I'm so happy that we are focusing on this topic today, that we have Paul with us. And Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, let me just say one thing, I'm sorry, before we, we uh, Paul comes on, that uh, Paul is going to talk for about 40 minutes or so, and then after which we'll open it up for Q&A. And please put your uh, your questions in the Q&A function. And then what I'll do is I'll read them and then present them to Paul, and she will respond. So, all right, Paul, it's yours. Take it over. Thank you very, very much, Donna. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you, James Kerwin, to have, think it, to have thought of me. And thank you, uh, Diane Long, to have helped me to prepare this presentation. Um, and a special hello to the Neiman Fellows who are maybe uh, listening to, uh, to the talk today. It's, for me, it was uh, quite special to prepare that talk. It was bringing me back to, uh, to the 90s, uh, bringing me back to this society that uh, is very, very dear to me, this corner of the world that I followed uh, from 1990 to 1996. Um, Billy, the, the, the next slide, please. Uh, the next one afterwards, I just want to introduce myself. So I'm from Quebec City. Um, maybe some people uh, among you have visited Quebec City um, from uh, a very, um, a very nice neighborhood. I was very privileged when I was younger. I was totally unprepared. I was totally unprepared was, uh, with, uh, with what uh, I, was, uh, I was about to, uh, to cover and to witness. Uh, this picture was taken in 1994. I was, with, uh, I was covering the Chechen war and uh, these soldiers were Russian soldiers. And, at the bottom right was my photographer who we were doing a documentary on the first Chechen war. So I was totally unprepared. You can't believe how unprepared I was for this. Never exposed to wars, never exposed to gun. I mean, from Canada, peaceful country, never exposed to, to war. Had a family 
my family, my both on both sides, uh, lived in Quebec City, probably didn't move since the 17th century. And the last battle they saw was the Plains of Abraham in 1759. So, um, I was, uh, I, was, uh, I was led by these, I was working in Windsor, Ontario after graduating uh, from McGill University in law. I wanted to be a journalist and I was working in Windsor, Ontario covering the auto industry with two guys from Associated Press. And at one point, these guys said, look, Paul, the Berlin Wall had just fallen. Um, we, uh, the next place will be Russia and the Soviet Union, and we're moving to Moscow, come with us. And at first I didn't know, and I was not prepared. I, actually, I was thinking to go to India, and they convinced me, and I went to the Soviet Union, a place that I didn't really know. I, I thought the Soviet Union was Russia, basically, and they were all Russians, uh, blonde, blue-eyed, and and, and, and I arrived in the Soviet Union and I was amazed by the diversity of this society. The, in, in the former Soviet Union, there were 128 ethnic groups and all these republics and the changes. Uh, next slide, please. The changes. So I arrived in, uh, it was the very end of the Cold War, the very end of the Soviet Union, and I didn't know that. Um, it was uh, Perestroika and Glasnost were raging. Gorbachev was in power, but the country was basically bankrupt. The economic system had collapsed. The picture, classic picture, remember, uh, for people of my generation and older, there were lines everywhere. There was absolutely nothing in the stores. Uh, the people lined even for a loaf of bread, and uh, it was very, very difficult for for everybody. It was difficult, but things were were changing very quickly. I have to say, um, so when I arrived, I've told you I was unprepared. I arrived there, I was discovering the Soviet Union, discovering its history, and I was fortunate enough to have a foreign correspondent credential. And even if I was a little schmuck in a way. I was what, 26, 27 year old. Um, I was a stringer. I was working for uh, French Canadian uh, newspapers at the beginning. I was treated like a VIP everywhere I went. And uh, I was flying all over the country, um, having, uh, you know, I was able to get uh, special tickets to go wherever. Going from Moscow to Tashkent was costing me 50 cents. So, uh, for me, it was an incredible experience and I was discovering a whole world. So yes, it was hard, but, next slide. It was hard, but it was also the beginning of East and West alliances that signified an openness to the West. And we were, um, for the first time, many of us working, um, sharing information, sharing work, uh, inviting each other to parties, um, Russians and um, Soviet, I would say, and expat like me, uh, young reporters. And my friends from uh, the Soviet Union were experimenting for the first time uh, free press. Um, they could talk openly. They could interview people they wanted. They could, they could tell the world what they thought was, going, was, was happening. And on that picture, you see a friend of mine, his name is Sergei Butman. He was the founder of the first independent radio station um, in, uh, in the Soviet Union, Eko Moskve. And Eko Moskve was actually situated really close to where I lived. So I was there very often. That was a happening place. And Sergei, remember this guy, because we'll talk about him later, and Sergei was, um, it was a first for him and his team. And it was an incredible effer effervescence, as we say in French, a lot of energy there. So freedoms were, were appearing everywhere. And it was a beautiful time for these people. Next slide. So it was 
endless, it was an endless amount of, of opportunity and potential. It was great for that young generation, but there were also very unhappy people. So they had, there were the, 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 the communist nostalgic, the old guard, they were not really happy with what was going on. They were afraid of losing power. And so in August of 1991, it's good because what's, what is happening right now, it's, it's interesting to go back in this time and to feel what was happening there at the time. So in August of 1991, when everybody were on holiday, even Gorbachev was at his dacha in Crimea, these guys, the communist nostalgic, the old guard of the communist party, among them the defense minister, the old guys launched a coup and uh, it really shook the Soviet Union, shook the world for a while. And uh, you woke up, I was not there the morning of the coup, I arrived the day after, but the morning of the coup on national radio, on state radio, there was music of Swam Lake, but Echo Moskve was broadcasting and Echo Moskve was broadcasting 24 seven what was happening in the streets of Moscow. So the putschist instructed the army to go in the streets and, uh, and there were tanks in the street. I was actually really, I was living in the middle of Moscow so you could see the tanks, you could see these young conscripts in the tanks and the mother stopping the tanks, giving them flowers, uh, uh, flowers and, and telling them that they shouldn't shoot, they couldn't shoot on people. And they were, uh, there was a moment there when um, you, uh, you felt like there would be a turning point. And um, so Ecomas Bay was broadcasting and people, more and more people was taken to the streets. And um, Boris Yeltsin, it was one of the, the great moment of Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin led this resistance. And the picture you saw here is a very memorable picture when Boris Yeltsin uh, stood up on a tank and talk to the people. And then at that time, you, the army, part of the army decided to support Boris Yeltsin. People, as I said, people took the streets. There were celebration. We felt that something was happening. And after three days, this coup was silence. And actually that was de facto the end of the Soviet Union. Next picture. So the end of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, this picture you see, and I want you to remember at that time, you had 100,000 people in the street of Moscow celebrating, celebrating the end of the Cold War, the end of that period where everything was frozen. So this picture is about the celebration of new beginnings, the, the, the hope, the time of the peace dividends that led ultimately uh, Francis Fukuyama to write his essay, The End of History. So, so, uh, so, so as a young reporter, uh, a young reporter that grew up in the 60s, 70s, um, where things were, you know, uh, slowly uh, happening with no, no huge moment in the streets of Canada, you're there and you witness the collapse of the Soviet Union, basically. The, the main event of the second part of the 20th century, it was, uh, it was very exciting. And we had access to everything. Next picture, please. We had access, it was so, the. The, the situation was very chaotic, but you had access to everything, to nearly everybody. The, you even had access to very close people, uh, to Boris Yeltsin and, and during press conferences, he was there. You could, uh, he, he was participating in scrums and same thing for the people uh, around him, his ministers. And at the same time, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union brought the independence of all these 15 republics. 
these republics, part of, apart from Russia, these republics, I'm thinking of the countries in the Baltics, Ukraine, Georgia, they aspired to freedom for a long, long time and they suffered under Stalin, under Brezhnev and, and the Soviet Union and, and nationalism in these republics were at an all time high. And they were, um, they were changes, of course, of there were transition in all these republics and it was fascinating to cover. And as I said earlier, as a, a foreign correspondent with the credential, I was able to go everywhere, to fly everywhere. And, um, and it, was, it was really fascinating. I remember being in Ukraine in autumn of 1991 when there was a referendum and I would like Putin to remember there was a referendum in Ukraine in 91 and 92% of the population, even in regions that were um, Russian speaking, 92% uh, wanted independence. So uh, there were great moments. This picture was taken in Georgia. In Georgia though, uh, like in Tajikistan, they were the, this uh, spurred a, a civil war that lasted couple of years and destroyed uh, uh, the center of, uh, part of the center of uh, Tbilisi, a beautiful capital. And um, actually it all, it, it didn't all go smoothly, uh, contrary of the peace dividend because of Stalinist policies, there were many micro wars that broke out all over. So in Georgia, Abkhazia, Georgia, Nagorno-Karabakh, Tajikistan, and the biggest and the most brutal of them all, next slide, uh, the most brutal and vicious of them all, Chechenia, the first Chechen war. Um, I was myself hooked on these, on these war. I was fascinated by by the, the transfer of power, of the dynamic between the leader of these republics and or the autonomous regions and the power in Moscow or, or in, in Tbilisi. But the first Chechen war was extremely brutal, like the second Chechen war also. But, but it, that first war was very significant. Why? Probably because all the rules of war were broken in Chechenia, all the rules of war. It was really the prelude of what we're seeing now. The Russian, the Russian army was bombing everything in Grozny, the capital. Journalists were killed. They were aiming sometimes at journalists. We have to remember that. And that was very, very different from the past. Um, I was driving one day, I was going to Grozny with my cameraman and we were in a little um, Lada car with a big sign on the car on the dashboard that we were pressed and we were passed by helicopters and suddenly one of the helicopter turned around and was really aiming, the guns were aiming at our car and for five seconds I really thought that was it. I really thought it was our last minutes we would, that we would die, but hopefully the helicopter lowered a little bit, but passed over us and continued. And we, we just thought, wow, we nearly died at that point. And um, we, uh, we were lucky, but friends of mine died in Chechenia. Uh, there was a young American photographer that was killed in Grozny, uh, just taking picture of a bombing. And just afterwards, Russian Air Force came back and bombed again, and she was killed. So uh, it was awfully violent. And on the Chechen side, they were starting to kidnap people. And they were kidnapping NGOs, uh, workers. Among them, a guy called Fred Cooney, who maybe some of you have heard uh, who was kidnapped and then died in captivity. So that was Chechenia that set the stage basically for the brutality our world was about to descend into. 
Next slide. Meanwhile, meanwhile, in Russia, throughout Russia, the people were suffering from the effect of Jeffrey Sachs shock therapy. Remember, uh, collapse of that communist economy, socialist economy at the extreme, and uh, the shock therapy to bring, to bring back uh, a capitalist economy implemented by the government of Boris Yeltsin. And we never, never really knew how that would go about, but for the people, it was extremely brutal. It was extremely brutal. It was, uh, it was just a free for all. Everything was on sale, and um, and in this big giant sale, uh, people lost their pension. You could so people were selling everything. Actually, everything was just on sale from nuclear. You know, remember you could for people of my generation again and older. Uh, we read stories, you know, like nuclear submarines were on sale and nuclear submarines, uh, arms, planes, old shoes, old fur coats, everything was, was to be bought. Um, and uh, it, was, it was just chaos and people were so worried because, and, and so worried because like, realize you know, from one day you are the citizen of uh, a superpower huh? the, your your leaders are telling you you're the best uh, and your world is the best and from one day to the next you're nothing basically you feel you feel very diminished very diminished you're humiliated you have no more pension you have to sell Toilet paper, I saw that old ladies selling toilet paper at the entrance of the metro station. There's no predictability. Huh? So when you're young and you have the energy, it's okay. And when you're very smart, you know, you're faster than the other ones and you, you buy, buy, buy and you become an oligarch maybe. But when you're just a normal Joe Blow, uh, 40 years old, 50, it's your world is destroyed. So, uh, so people were very worried and it was the end of the 90s and that's when i left russia i left russia and uh in that in you know in that chaos and then uh, while i was away uh there is a, a guy that came that came along next slide boris yeltsin uh boris yeltsin left power and Vladimir Putin took over. So there was no order. And this guy said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna restore order. I'm gonna make Russia great again. <laughs> Maybe it sounds familiar. I'm gonna make Russia great again. And the Russian liked it. Uh, just a little anecdote, um, you know, in Canada, in the US, you ask someone, hey, how are you? And they'll say, uh, oh, it's okay, it's bad, it's good, it's, you know, it's whatever. But over there in Russia, and people will, will, will respond, everything is in order. Everything is in order. Well, at that time, and you have to remember, because it's very important now, when you see the propaganda, Putin's propaganda, well, uh, at that time, there was no order. It was all chaotic. And this guy, Vladimir Putin said, I'm gonna restore prestige. I'm, the, I'm gonna restore order. I'm gonna regain the status we have lost. And I will, I will make Russia great again, a mixture of the Soviet Union and the Imperial Russia. Next slide. So of course, you want to restore order. So the first part of his restoration of order was to take back the independence voice, the independent voices. I don't know if some people uh, see, uh, know what is, well, this is Vladimir Putin. This is a, a Muppet of Vladimir Putin. Uh, it was part of, um, well, there was a Muppet show called Kukli. 
and it was very popular in Russia quickly. It was fun. Imagine, you know, after 70 years of Soviet Union where you couldn't really, you, the, the Russians have a great sense of humor, but, you know, uh, during the Soviet times, you can you could not really express it on TV that much, uh, especially when it concerned political figures. So the Muppet Show was was super quickly, was, was was very funny, and they were laughing at everybody, Yeltsin famously, and even Putin. But Putin, hmm, I guess, didn't really like it. So um, the Kukli was one of the, well, I guess was threatening to him and Kukli was one of the first thing that went up the air. Um, the, it was broadcasted by NTV, it was what that belonged to Guzinski, an oligarch, and Guzinski was thrown out of Russia and, and this, the, the state uh, took control of uh, that independence channel. And while well, the Muppet Show was killed in a way, and so were uh, many shows. Next slide. Uh, so many shows, shows uh, hosted a show, in, in, for example, of my friend Sergei Parkomenko, another Sergei, Sergei Parkomenko, who was a young uh, journalist stars in the 90s. And Sergei, at the beginning of the, the, the Year the year two thousands uh, had a, had a TV show. He also founded a, a weekly newspaper called Itogi in the nineties, Sivonia, and um, Sergey um, started to lose everything. Actually, Sergey through the year two thousands lost everything. He was uh, lost his magazine, lost. The, what he had as a journalist. He just had a little show on Eko Maspe who remained at the end of the 2000s. And it's just an example of uh, one of the journalists that were so upcoming and, and so creative in the 90s that were just shut, shut up. They, they were just, uh, they were silenced. Next slide. And of course, they uh, silenced uh, the press and uh, they went even further. Some of the most prominent voices were just killed, assassinated. At the uh, top left corner, Anna Polikovskaya uh, was assassinated in her home, uh, in the entrance of her home, actually in the elevator of her home in October 2006. Uh, she was a very well-known journalist who worked on corruption issues, covered the First and Second Chechen War, a very brave woman. They tried to poison her, and then, and then finally they killed her in October 2006. Georgi Gongadze, uh, the journalist on the bottom left, a young uh, Ukrainian-Georgian journalist, also uh, working publishing on corruption issues, in Ukraine, uh, who was killed in um, 2000, and his uh, his murder um, uh, was the catalyst uh, to the orange one of the catalysts to the orange revolution. And of course, on the right side, uh, Boris Nemtsov, the opposition leader, who died in February 2015. Boris Nemtsov that I've met um, was uh, an opposition figure, uh, pro-democracy, uh, pro-Western, um, who, um, uh, who was admired by many. And one night he was doing his show at Eko Moskve. It was the only independent radio outlet now at that time doing his show. And, and, and after the show, um, um, came back uh, home walking and on the bridge, just in front of the Kremlin, just in front of the Kremlin was killed. It was very symbolic. You could just imagine uh, an opposition figure killed just in front of the White House. Well, that was exactly that. Uh, Nemtsov was killed. It was like, a, they said at the time, it was like a present to Vladimir Putin they suspected <clears throat> Chechen, uh, some Chechen factions, but we never really knew who killed Nemtsov, but Nemtsov disappeared. And uh, again, 
the, the voice, the free voices were silenced. Next slide. So <clears throat> I'm still away, um, never went back to the Soviet Union, uh, but following it closely. <clears throat> and in 2014, in the middle of hosting um, the Sochi uh, Olympics, the world was watching, in the middle of hosting the Sochi Olympics, remember, Vladimir Putin invades Crimea. And the world uh, plays, uh, plays Neville Chamberlain at that time. Peace in our time, actually. They appeased him. In 2014, in the middle of the Olympics, the world didn't do anything when Vladimir Putin and his troops invaded Crimea. Um, I was shocked and there were also events uh, that we know in 2014 in Kiev and the beginning of the Donbass war. And I, uh, I come back in 2014, a year after to do a documentary on, uh, on Russia, uh, on Russia 25 years later. And I wanted to, to meet uh, the people with who I sympathize in the, in the 90s and we were doing a documentary. And it was in uh, autumn of uh, 2014 and it was the first time I came back to Russia. And um, I, was, I was struck, I was struck by what I saw. And I saw two de diametrically opposed, uh, opposed ideas. Uh, on one side, uh, you had a super duper eye candy. The eye candy was phenomenal. There were restaurants and very good restaurants with everybody, you know, like also, well, it was not at the time in the 90s, people who were able to go to restaurants and cafes were often mafia people or very rich people. Now in restaurants, you just saw middle class. You had shops everywhere. It was a super place to, to go shopping. Gorky Park, was beautiful, clean with cafes and all kinds of, uh, of uh, activities. But at the same time, the, indep the independent voices were totally silenced. They were, well, not totally, totally, but they were silenced. They were one free radio, Eko Moskve, one free TV, Deutsch TV, and one newspaper, Nezavisimaya Gazeta, and was, was basically all for a country of 140 million people. Um, so, and uh, very interestingly, uh, the people who in the 90s were in the opposition, the people who represented nostalgia, the who wanted a return to the Soviet Union, who resented the new direction at the time of Russia, who were against this, they were appalled by democracy in a way. Well, these people were in the, in the street, not demonstrating uh, against the government, but demonstrating for the government. And that picture was taken um, uh, during a demonstration in uh, November 2015 where um, 2015, where people were like, you could read in French, Putin, nous sommes avec toi, Putin, we are with you. And they were claiming back the border of the Soviet Union. Uh, I, mem I remember meeting a 25 year old uh, women, young women, leader of that demonstration saying, we want Kiev back in, uh, in our country. We want the, the borders back to uh, what they were uh, during the Soviet Union. So um, it was very telling. And at the time, like I've written here, all the elements were assembled. There was the war in the Donbass, but they were the signs of a, of a, of a bigger war were imminent, were imminent and the world refused to see. Next picture. So the world refused to see, and suddenly, seven years, seven years later, we had the invasion uh, of February uh, 24, 
2022. At the time, a um, couple of days, uh, well, at the time I was a member of the National Assembly of Quebec, that's uh, the equivalent of your uh, state legislature. And um, two days before the invasion, we didn't know that the invasion would happen. Two days before, um, we, uh, we voted a motion at, uh, at the National Assembly and the Parliament supporting Ukraine. And I was given the opportunity to give a speech. And I will always remember that speech. I, um, I said, uh, guys, I said, um, Kiev, today Kiev is a European city. Today in Kiev, people are bringing their children to school. They're doing their groceries. Uh, they're going to work, but maybe in two days, well, they will be no more. Their life will be shattered, totally changed. And um, it's exactly, exactly what happened. Their life, we cannot believe how much their life was were changed. Um, suddenly, and you know, I think we have to we have to, to realize suddenly, yes, there was the, the war in the Donbass, but, but the general war in the country, suddenly that the philosophy student became a warrior, the plastic surgeon became, became a war surgeon, the, uh, the babushka was cooking borscht for the soldiers. Life was totally different. And uh, they put up a total resistance and, uh, uh, Putin didn't really play his card right. We know what happened. They wanted to take uh, Kiev in seven days, a week, and uh, now they're still uh, they're still fighting in Ukraine. Next slide. So I was uh, I was uh, a member of the National Assembly, and I had the opportunity at the time, as a member of the National Assembly, to participate to a fact finding mission in Ukraine. So what do you think I, I said? I said, yes, of course. I wanted to go back to Ukraine. I visited Ukraine in 91, covered the independence there and the beginning of this new country. I had many friends, I mean, journalist friends. And of course I wanted to go back. And uh, it was a fact-finding mission uh, based uh, outside of Kiev in the regions it was in May, so it was in the regions where uh, Russia, uh, uh, Russian uh, army occupied, uh, that Russian army occupied, but left, of course, uh, when uh, retreated in the, the, the eastern part of the country. So I went to that little village called Kutuzhenka, uh, um, very close to Bucha, very close to Irpin, uh, that we heard a lot on the news. Uh, Bucha, remember the the tragedy, the people that were uh, that were killed uh, and the summary uh, executions. But the the little village of Katuzhenka also suffered the uh, Russian occupation. And I met, and on the picture you see Olga, Olga and her uh, four year old son Dima, and uh, we meet Olga who told us uh, that she lost her husband during the first days of the Russian occupation of her village. Um, it's an awfully sad story. Um, she was, uh, the husband drove her to a safe place with her child and her mother, and he was going back to the village to buy water and food. And uh, he bought food and he was on his way back and he was stopped in the middle of the village uh, by a column of tanks because the tanks were coming from Belorussia going down through his village going towards Kiev and uh, he was there in his car not threatening at all uh, his car and other cars were had, had stopped and suddenly stood uh, stood uh, well came out from one of the tank a soldier who stood on the top of his tank and fired upon the cars. He fired upon the cars and, and Olga's husband's car exploded. Uh, he was killed in the explosion and so were also uh, half a dozen people that day. Uh, 
And we discovered that it was just systematic. They did that also in the coming weeks. Um, as a whole, this little village of 800 people uh, had 12, 000, uh, 12, 12, sorry, 12 people that were killed um, in, the, in these, uh, th these first three days, 12, 000, uh, 12 people that were killed in these uh, in these few day, in these three uh, first days and so it really installed terror in the village and um, it was uh, it was absurd because people were telling me they had family on the other side of the border they had family in Russia I remember a, a, a woman telling me that her her own father was living on the other side of the border and did not believe her, did not believe what was going on because the propaganda was so loud in Russia. Next slide. So the propaganda was for someone like me when, you know, who covered Russia in the 90s and saw uh, freedom of speech and expression and, and a lot of cynicism. People didn't really believe that, uh, that we're always questioning the, the state. Uh, the propaganda that was going on and is still going on in Russia is very impressive. So these people who, like, uh, Ukrainians are able to phone their families in Russia, but a lot of them stopped phoning, stopped talking to their friends in Russia, because uh, there's a the narrative is so strong, and and this message is really getting through people over there. Uh, you know, Ukraine uh, is Russia is saving Ukraine. Uh, you heard that on the news. You know, Ukraine, uh, Russia is saving Ukraine. They are denazifying the country, despite the fact that the, ironically, the president is Jewish. Um, and uh, the Russians are the victims. So yeah, uh, Zelensky government is a Nazi government, but NATO is behind this. And NATO is the bad guy. And the, the big, big bad guy is the US. And so NATO is the aggressor. Um, so it's. It's like the world, the, the world upside down, and it's working. And it's the rhetoric of the Second World War. Uh, you know, it, he's basically using um, the same rhetoric uh, as Hitler, um, and um, and but saying that you know the country is a victim, um, and and playing on on Stalin and 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 Hitler's rhetoric mixing all that together and it's very very strong and it's and it's working and he's really the puppet master right now and you have to remember people started to buy this because he was promising to restore order and prestige so russia right now is uh, there are still still some foreign journalists but um it's i'd love to go but it's very difficult to access. I don't know if I would ever have a visa. Our office, uh, well, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation had an office since the 80s that uh, we had to close because it was just too dangerous to, uh, to have our journalists over there. Uh, on, on the US side, I think, you, I think some, some uh, offices, some bureaus are still open. But it's very dangerous. Uh, you could be put 15 years. You could you could be uh, you could be put in jail for 15 years just criticizing the war. So uh, the, the 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 world is totally. I mean, the 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 theater of war is totally different right now. Next slide. So uh, yeah. So um, I. Um, so I, I went with the NGO, uh, my mandate uh, came to an end as a, as a member of the National Assembly, and I had an offer from a newspaper in, uh, in, in Montreal to, to do a, a long trip in Europe and in the former Soviet Union um, to, uh, to see how uh, they were affected by that war, how the war impacted Europe and the former Soviet Union. So, I came. A, I kind of became a journalist again in a totally different context. Um, 
I, at the time in the 90s, as I said, access incredible, but technically it was super hard. I mean, we had to phone the receptionist, the operator, we had to, to book a call to, to our, uh, our uh, bureaus and she was phoning us back. And then if it was a radio story, we would record. And then if it was in the phone, and if it was uh, if it was a text, we would put our the phone on couplers, and the the computer would talk to the phone, and we would send our stories. Sometimes it didn't work, so we had to dictate our stories. Sometimes we couldn't even uh, phone from the hotel, so we had to go to the central telephone station to find the operator physically and ask her to plug us in. You know, so it was super complicated. And now, um, you know, I could set, I could do everything on my iPhone. I could take super quality picture on my iPhone. I could follow the war in real time. There's open sources. Uh, there's all kinds of things. Uh, my friends who worked in TV could could send stories. They don't have to reserve satellite time. They just send their stories when they can. Again, and nearly, on, I think they could do it even, I'm sure they can do it on their phone if they need to. So it, it was, uh, so in a way, it's very different, different. In a way, I think it was easier to work in the 90s. Um, and, and now there's propaganda, the, the messages, you, you are bombarded by information. I think the, the Ukrainian war is the most covered war in history, but you have to verify the sources constantly. I mean, people follow the war on Instagram and on TikTok, can you imagine? So, and you have AI that can create some videos. You think it's true, but it's not true. So, I mean, it's very, very tricky. Plus there's a propaganda. And if you're in Ukraine, well, you know, they're well organized and also they control the message. So, and people is, are difficult to access. It's difficult to have an interview with, uh, you know, ministers and I'm not, not even talking about Zelensky it's, or, or his wife. Everything is, 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 is very complicated. So, um, so it's very, uh, there's a big paradox before, uh, between before and, and now, but still very fascinating. Next, next slide. Um, so there's a lot of emotion, you know, there's a lot of, of emotion being in Ukraine, you're touched by the, the resilience of the Ukrainians, the courage of the Ukrainians, the energy they have, you know, because even if there's no electricity, light goes on, if there's a, a bomb alerts, they go in shelter. When it's okay, they go out. Some people stay in their office. They continue their life. They go to restaurant. They, it's touching, you know. And uh, but uh, there's and I traveled uh, during that last trip. I traveled to I went to Ukraine, but I went also to Georgia. I went to Poland. I went to the Baltics. And there's a very very strong sense of Russophobia. Um, Russians are put in the same basket. And uh, uh, the, I've met young Russians in Tbilisi, very anti-regime, uh, who are also, their life is, is shattered. It's, it's very difficult for them. But of course, they, how could I say, they, 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 they receive, the, they, they are, um, they, I mean, they are the collateral damage of that war too, because uh, they're hated in Tbilisi. They are tolerated, but they're hated. And um, you talk to human rights activists uh, around there in in, uh, in the Baltics, of course, in Ukraine and, and in Georgia, and um, they are just anti-Russian, anti-every Russian. So. So one should be very careful because not all Russians are the same and the voice of democracy is very thin, but is still there. Next slide. Uh, my friend Sergei Butman that you saw at the beginning. Well, his children have left. His, some of his children are journalists, they have left. Uh, he's 67 right now and he decided to stay. He decided to stay and 
Alexei Benediktov, maybe some people have heard of, about him, uh, I've heard of him, but Alexei Benediktov was the editor-in-chief of Eco Moscow. they decided to stay. And they are labeled, uh, not yet Sergei, but Alexei are labeled foreign agent. Um, so they are kind of radioactive in, uh, in Moscow. Um, they are, you know, the, the, the state are, uh, by, tar by labeling them foreign agent, are saying that they are not credible, that they are influenced by the West, by, uh, by the bad West. And they could be, they could be arrested anytime. They are controlled. Uh, they could be, uh, there could be perquisitions. They could, they could enter their home anytime. Uh, they could be detained anytime. And uh, it's, it's very, very hard for them. But they're still there. And Sergei is telling me, you know, some people have to stay there. It's important to stay there. Next slide. It's important to stay there. And uh, in a way it's, uh, when you look at what's going on, you, you're wondering how will it end? How will it end? It could drag on and on, but you never know. Never did, no, nobody predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, nobody predicted what happened afterwards. Uh, and it happened. Um, the, you know, the, in, in, in any other country, I mean, in, in, in our countries, a guy who, 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 uh, who, who launched an evasion that failed totally, where people are still fighting, when, where there were huge military mistakes, when there are 200, at least uh, we're saying 200,000 casualties, uh, dead soldiers and wounded soldiers, a guy who, who brought his country in such a mess would be thrown out. But it's not like that in Russia. It's, uh, as you say, as you know, it's, uh, it's an autocracy. Um, and uh, and there, if, if, you know, you cannot call a, a committee to study the, 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 the mess that happened during the last year and um, election, there will be election, uh, I think it's next year. Uh, well, they are a parody in a way. You cannot change your leader uh, democratically. So um, there too, anything could happen. Look at Prehojin, look at the people around Putin right now who uh, are also very ambitious. Um, they, um, when in a, an autocracy, when things starts going bad, uh, the society uh, is becoming a pressure cooker and you never know when it will explode. Um, it's very interesting. Maybe we could go back to the, just one last time to the, 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 the picture of the Sergei Butman. Um, yeah, uh, well, Sergei managed to do a show on the social media. It's a show on dictators, dictators. He's not talking about Putin, he's talking about uh, the history of dictators. And when I last talked to him last week, he said, it's very interesting because, um, you know, you, you realize that dictator arrive, uh, uh, di dictators arrive, destroy their country, and then after the country, it's their country that are destroying them. And he says, I think, that really what is, uh, is, is, is maybe what, what, what could happen to, uh, to our uh, leader Vladimir Putin. So uh, who knows? So how will it end? Next slide. I don't know, I'd like to hear you. If we still have time, I, I didn't watch, uh, I, I didn't watch my timer. So uh, <laughs> now I see. So, um, so I, I Thank you very much for, for listening to me. And I'd like to hear you. I'd like to have your insight on what's going on. Uh, yeah, I mean, sadly, we have run out of time, um, uh, Paula. And I know that there was even so much more you could have shared with us. And what I appreciate myself in particular is that you shared with us the broader context, the historical context 
which, you know, we don't get that information uh, through the media. We don't get this in-depth an analysis that you took us through here. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that because now it, it makes more sense to me. And I felt like I was an informed person. So thank you for that. And, you know, as I said, uh, we, we really don't have much time. I mean, people basically want to know, I'm just reading through the Q&A section. They want to know, you know, what would happen, for example, if Putin died or if someone killed him or what would be the concept, what would happen? And then I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it at that because we have to, Nicole Bryant is going to get on for a couple of minutes. And, and um, so if you could just shed light on that, because many people have that question. Well, what happens when this dictators die? There's example in history, you know, uh, uh, there's example in history. Of course, there could be turmoil. Uh, that's that's the, and especially in the present context when there's a war. So if Putin's die, uh, everything can happen. Um, and there's there's people like Kadyrov, who's the leader of the Chechen militia, who uh, would maybe say, you know, I've given so much in that war, please give me, you know, I want independence for my people. I want independence for that territory. And then you have people from Tatarstan saying, well, you know, this is a mess, we want to be independent. And you don't know, uh, in, uh, you know, what could uh, what that could trigger. So uh, it, it uh, we were talking about order and chaos. Well, chaos could suddenly be, uh, be back. Most likely, right, Paul? Most likely it would be a return to their worst nightmares about and yeah. yeah. Yeah, revolutions in uh, in in Russia uh, were never maybe only the 1991 revolution, but were uh, never too peaceful. There was a lot of violence, a lot of people killed and um, you know, talking to my friend Sergei Butman, that's exactly what he said, you know, if that happens, if Putin disappears, um, you know, yeah, I mean, if, if, if uh, Russia loses that war, uh, Ukraine is, is okay, U Ukraine is, it's, it's, uh, they're going to be fine, but Russia um, will, could collapse, you know, so after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, you could see uh, turmoil in Russia and the collapse of Russia or the, the Russia being dismantled in a way. Yeah, well, we're going to have to leave it at that, uh, Paul. I know people had so many other questions and, you know, perhaps they can contact you uh, yes. uh, if, if that's okay with you. And uh, again, thank you so much for that, you know, that personal and that also that political analysis and that historical analysis. It was, for me, it was very enriching. So thank you, thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole, who's gonna say a few things about uh, some PON events that are coming up. Thank, uh, thank you again, Paul. Thank you, Don and, and Paula. Thank you so much for this really insightful presentation. I can only echo what, um, what Donna has said. It's always a pleasure to have these Kelman events. Um, in collaboration with the Weatherhead Center and to learn so much every day that we come to work. We are um, uh, very grateful for your insights. Um, a little bit more about other events that the Program on Negotiation is going to be hosting in the coming weeks and months. We have a busy month of March uh, coming up with a number of uh, one-hour virtual events such as this, starting with uh, our PON faculty members, Francesca Gino and Julia Minson, on March 10th, so we hope to see you then, perhaps also at one of our uh, more in-depth classes, either in person right here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or virtually online uh, through a series of classes, either for one or two days at a time. Thank you uh, very much, of course, once again, to Paul Robitaille for her uh, for her insights. Thank you also, Donna, of course, uh, for doing such a great job uh, hosting. And thank you to the PON staff, specifically James Kerwin, Diane Long, and Billy Fairfield for all of their work getting us here today. We hope to see everybody very soon. Thank you and stay well. <laughs>